I'll click. Yeah, okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. I will be discussing graph data models today. Uh, in our previous episodes, we have discussed about what are data models and what are the different levels of modeling we do. We have to do. So, uh, moving on <coughs> uh, with that uh, today, uh, let's see how graph data models work and what are the integrities in that. To start with, let's see the agenda for today. Uh, at very first, I will be discussing a small evolution of data models from where it is started and from where it is now. Okay, uh, through the years, through the decades, I would say. And then we can uh, move on to actually understanding what graph data models actually are. Okay, and after that, we will be <clears throat> looking at why there is a need of graph data model and why should we use it actually. And then we can <clears throat> go into a little bit a technical thing of how to do, how to perform actually a graph data model. Okay, and what are the things to consider while doing those things? Then uh, we'll be discussing when is a when graph data model should be used because uh, there may be cases where graph data model looks fancy but doesn't satisfy everything which we need. So we have to understand when do we need a graph data model and when not to. After that, I will be quickly going through the current available graph databases and uh, where it stands with all the performance and complexity and all those things. Okay, so uh, let's start with, uh, so evolution, this the data modeling evolution started in 1960s basically. Before that, uh, computers are only considered as a giant calculators. So in 1960s, the need uh, arose that uh, the real world entities and the real world scenarios have to be stored in some way so that they can be looked upon and queried upon. So in order to map a real world uh, entities or scenarios to a computerized format, they need a technique and that technique they called as a data modeling. So the evolution happened actually in four phases. The first phase was uh, basically <clears throat> many things happened in this phase, but the uh, most prominent were network data model, uh, hierarchical data model, inverted list. And at the end of this phase, the object oriented databases are also started to come up. Okay, so basically in these things, they only want uh, to visualize how real world scenarios exist and then convert them into a format which can be stored into the system. OK, so uh, the these are the major uh, evolutions happened through the year. So if you see. IMS came about in 1968. Which was an hierarchical database and then uh, in 1970. Uh, a theory was published about relational data model for large data and uh, banks. Actually. So by that, the ER modeling, which we, which we must have used in our careers, came about in 1976, and then the Oracle and Ingress. IBM DB2 in 83, and Cognito, which was the, one of the first in-memory stores, came about in 1989. The second wave started around 1990. Sorry. Uh, so the second wave was called the relational wave, where this relational databases uh, and all the modeling techniques, all the uh, querying techniques are getting evolved and grown into a <coughs> space where huge data quantities can be stored and processed and a lot of things can be done there but they started to lose their users by 2000, uh, beginning of 2000 somewhere. At the same time, the decision support wave, where the big analytical queries like online analytic processing and very specialized DBs for a specific purpose started to come up also. So the, the, here are the few. So Red Brick Warehouse came in 1990. Okay, UML 
in 1996. I'm just highlighting the things which we have used in our careers. Okay, and W3C RDF, the theory was published in 1999. Okay, so after this, the last wave was the NoSQL wave. Okay, so here actually uh, in this decade, a huge shift happened from uh, what was existing a relational model and uh, how people used to understand and save data. That shift started from here to uh, save it and model it in many different ways, which suits the scenario for which an application or for which purpose the modeling is done. Earlier, for any scenarios, the modeling need to be done by the way databases can store. But now modeling was more focused on how to capture the real world complexity. And then let's see which of the best we have to uh, store that information into our system. So in this wave, uh, the Neo 4J came in 2007. Okay, Mark Logic in 2003. And the Sysme, the first Aduna Sysme, the first RDF database, which came about in 2002. And now we are seeing in Apache, Spark, Hadoop, HBase, all those things came up for it later. And till now, uh, major developments have been going on on this field. Okay, and graph DBs, it started from 2008, and then they realized the importance of graphs and graph data modeling. And it became popular from 2008 and is being heavily used at various levels of data modeling. Uh, okay, so uh, is it clear till now? I'm not sure I move forward. Yeah, very good, Okay, so Moving on, what is actually a graph data model? So uh, this is just a simple example of Amazon Web Services. Uh, so you can see here there is a region which is located in a continent, has an is isolated availability zone, offers services, and charges applied on that. Thing. So this is a very simple model for an AWS EC2 service, okay? And using this model, uh, let's say if I have to ask a question that which is the cheapest uh, EC2 service available in North America? Okay, so if you see, this query is quite complex, though it's a very realistic real-world scenario, but uh, trying to convert it into a mechanism to save and retrieve data is complex. but through graphs, it became very easy because the relationships take precedence. So we, from there, we know that continent, okay, North America, what are the regions available, and then what are the prices there, which are servicing EC2 instances, and we can get the answer to the query, answer of the query in a very uh, small amount of time spent on it. So this is actually a graph data model, okay, where. Uh, Entities, the real world entities are represented as uh, nodes, and the relationship between them is not denoted as a directed lines. So one node is connected to other node through a directed relationship. Let's see one more example. So this is basically a simple relational model where an organization has a department and a person and a project. Okay, and there are few relationships between them. Okay, now if I have to convert this into a graph data model, it can be done like this. I have four entities denoted as node, organization, department, project, and person. Okay, and then the directed relationships can answer all the queries which can be answered by here in a much simpler and much faster way. And the most important point is much easier to understand here rather than here. So, uh, any question from these two examples? Okay, so uh, now let's try to define what actually graph data modeling is. So, 
So Gravita modeling is a process where the user describes an arbitrary domain as a connected graph of nodes and relationship with properties and labels. So uh, I will come to later what uh, actually the nodes, relationship, properties and labels are. But the concept here is that any real world scenario, if it is able to uh, <clears throat> model it in a certain way where nodes can represent an, a real world entity or a complex data structure, I would say. And those nodes are connected with the <clears throat> relationships which can have their own properties as well. So if we can model that, uh, uh, create a model out of this, uh, then it, it's, it's a more natural way of seeing a real world scenario. And because of the technology now available, it can directly be stored as such as well. Okay, uh, let's look at a more technical or more detailed definition. Let me say that <clears throat> model in which a data structure or the schema or instance can be modeled as directed, possibly labeled graph, where data manipulation is expressed by graph-oriented operation. Okay, so basically, uh, with this definition, we can uh, categorize graph data model into a broadly three categories. One is representing a data or a schema with the notion of graph, or uh, the data manipulation which we used to do like uh, nearest path or <clears throat> graph patterns or connectivity. Those kind of operations is expressed through graph. That's the second category. And third category would be the integrity constraints. So integrity constraints, uh, if I explain to you, if you want to uh, update something. OK, so uh, we can put a graph, uh, small graph model to execute all the integrities, all the updates happening to go through that graph before the actual uh, thing is updated. So that which which is uh, to ensure the consistency of updating, updation or deletion of any node or data from the database. So these are broadly three categories. The majority of data modeling is done on these two things, and these are actually handled by the physical data modeling layer. Uh, am I clear till now? Or I'm running too fast? Uh, well, can you give us an example of nodes and relationships? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, will, I will come to this in the how part. OK, so uh, if we go into this, so this is actually a node. So this every entity. So here we see that there are four entities, right? An organization a department, a project, and a person. OK, so now in, in the graph data model, a node is an actual entity in the real world. So person become a node, project becomes a node, department and organizations are also nodes. And the connection between them, which is, uh, let's say, organization contains department, a person works for a department and, depart <coughs> and led by a department. So these are the actual relationships between person and department. OK, person is also related to a project, which we can say that it's a dedicated to or assigned to or working on. So this is also a relationship between a person and a project. And the project is owned by a department. So these uh, directed lines are actually relationship between the two. Did that answer your question, Ajay? Yeah, yes, it is. OK. <clears throat> so uh, I hope what is data modeling uh, is now clear to all of us. Uh, as uh, per definition. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, in your previous slide, can you? Mm -hmm. So in this, I'm just trying to see what are the differences I'm seeing between the normal relationship diagram and Mm -hmm. uh, this graph data model. Mm -hmm. uh, what information is giving me? Um, what information is coming from graph mode? Is the relationship between the tables, not the table, the entities, is it? Yes, the relationship is also currently uh, these tables, 
let's say project member department member these department member these are not actually the entities okay so these are uh, intrinsic relationship which we create to relate these two right so but ideally, these, uh, ideally i don't think uh, there is a need of these three white tables here any anyway. because uh, these are these can be handled through primary and foreign key i think rather means uh, in this example uh, how we can see that graph is helping yeah. more i think the left hand side is there's one way to represent relationship as another table which yeah. basically connects two tables um the other way is like you mentioned obviously you can have organization id in the person table and person id in the organization table and you can set up a foreign key primary key association but mm-hmm. but uh, i think what is lost here is the meaning of the relationship the moment you say two tables are related by this particular foreign key yeah. um, that, that it is not a, a, a semantic meaning in in that relationship it is just a primary key foreign key relationship you cannot understand that who is part of what like what is the direction of the relationship right direction also you will know by saying that uh, the primary key of this table is a foreign key in that table and therefore it the direction of the relationship will be evident but the meaning of the relationship for example here in the right hand side we say person works for a particular department mm-hmm. the works for here is the is the meaning now the, the i think one key differentiate differentiator in the data models is that the semantic meaning of the data uh, in the left hand side is uh, left to the uh, to the application level i mean at the table level at the data model level we mm-hmm. just say two entities are related with the foreign key primary key but the actual meaning of the relationship is known to the application or the developers only but on the right hand side the data model itself uh, has that semantic meaning of how these entities are related so so that that's uh, that, that to me presentation of like presentation of the application or actual implementation then hmm it can yeah, be so, so the that, actual yeah. implementation i think the, the le- one this on the one. left also the one on the left also i mean uh, why these kind of tables might exist uh, one basic example of this could be some master tables uh, for example in some cases we might not be uh, I'll, i'll just ke- take one example from from uh, uh, this uh, msi sgn2 mz uh, master mm-hmm. which is a uh, global list which just exists and two tables they can basically relate to each other through that list but we don't really need it right if mz is there in the in some part. cases we might need it because there there could be some tables which lack the mz or which which lack the um, msi in for that matter that you when you are putting into the table itself then only you merge this two and you do it right it means you look up and do it but at the end to the application it should not be visible there is a way to do that right yeah it might it might be but i am talking about the existence of them so so, so if um, i mean if you look at the human perspective if you look at two relational tables connected in a certain way um, mm-hmm. because we know what person means we know what organization means and therefore by, by human inference we know mm-hmm. what is the meaning of this relationship Mm-hmm. but but the the where the future is to have uh, machines automatically understanding and uh, and inferring something from these relationships mm-hmm. in, in such scenarios the data model must have more declarative meaning of the relationships and that's what the graph data models are uh, providing actually yeah mm. if we are reading through random data not mm-hmm. unstructured data and trying to get get out the relationship between the entities and all mm-hmm. that Mm. Exactly. exactly so so the data model must becomes more complete yeah. if it has the semantic meaning of relationships uh, within the model itself so it becomes complete that way yeah and and then it becomes even for humans as well as for machines to make some inferences uh, in a in a non ambiguous manner okay indeed you were saying that this uh, graph data model is so uh, in, in the nodes and their relationship and with the properties and tags uh, can you give me show me the properties and tags in this is this listed here are those listed here uh, uh okay i will tell you but uh, i will cover that thing into the how part 
Okay, but uh, here actually, uh, if you see this role, member one is actually a property of this relationship. So these three title, start date, end date, person ID, first name, these are the attributes of the person. Mm -hmm. And person itself is actually a label. So you can label a node with more than one labels. You can say it a person or you can say it a, a author also. So uh, these labels will decide which relationships to take. So if you just say a person, uh, I mean, if you say a author, you, you can then follow the author kind of a subgraph to uh, maintain that. Those features are available in. What is the difference between node and tag? Then? Node and tag label is just a label for that node. So this node is actually an entity that is labeled as person or author or anything else. So is it like this, like a, a manager or a author or anybody can be a person? So person yes. becomes a node, but the yes. label is manager and author. Mm, uh, yes. Okay. okay. So uh, moving on quickly to the why part. So, I mean, I, uh, we have already discussed few advantages of uh, why graph data models are needed and actually why graph models are helpful. So uh, the basic difference is the focus is on rela relationship and data interconnectivity. In all the relational models, the entities and their attributes and what all information they can contain, those take much higher precedence than anything else. Relationship is a second, second class citizen, which can be managed by different ways. But here, both of them uh, are on the same level relationships between data also take precedence. Okay, so the, the second thing is it's the most natural way to understand and Thank model. You. I don't understand the first point. Okay, what, what did you understand? Means can you just elaborate by example because... Uh, 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 exactly, that's what we were discussing in just uh, one slide before here, that relationships are also considered here. Here, relationships are not actually that important. We can do it like this way, or we can do it like a primary foreign key uh, way also. Here, the project, the person, the entities take much higher precedence. Okay, and while querying also, you, you, you don't take relationship into consideration. If you have to do, then you can either go by this way or use the foreign uh, key to get the relationship. But relationships are not as at the same level as the entities itself. Here, both of them as the same level. Same but level means you can uh, query or design a, a querying mechanism by relationships also. Here, okay. you cannot design a query mechanism based only on relationship. Okay, okay. that's what that is. Uh, okay, so. It's the most natural way to understand and model because as we see in the real time world, we can actually draw it and that actually becomes a graph data model which can be realized in a physical storage. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> the higher level, I mean the efficient algorithms, graph algorithms like short test path or uh, nearest, these kind of things can also be realized and because of the relationships uh, at the same level as entities. Doing uh, that thing in a relational model would be a very tedious job. You have to jump on table, on table, on table, and to understand what foreign key primary key relationships are there to get to the whole path of it. Here, it's much easier because it's stored in that way. Okay. Uh, it, it provides an abstraction for the uh, user because user only sees the graph data model and can understand what actually is there. There may be a case that you model in graph, but you actually store in some uh, in other ways. The user don't need to understand how it is stored or how it is done. It understands the graph model with the abstraction and uh, he generates or uh, creates his queries according to that graph. 
So uh, the same thing which we were saying, easier and faster conversion of business thinking into data structures, because uh, what business thinks are actually, uh, I mean, if you see human mind doesn't understand tables as much as they understand the nodes and their relationship. So in that way, it becomes much easier for business to understand and then uh, try to convert it into a business use case. So they, they perform low latency performance with the uh, if, if the query complexity is big. So I mean, uh, later I will cover actually uh, where they are lacking and what relational databases can provide and uh, graph cannot. Yeah, and one of the major thing is that because the relationship is also there, the complex queries becomes faster, but quantitative queries will become slower. OK, and the most important uh, benefit of using graph data model is that they can be extendable without much of an effort because it's just nodes and their relationships. So if there is a new relationship or new node coming in relating to other different entities, it can quickly be extended and uh, move on with it. Uh, in relational mean, ma managing and creating those things, it's a uh, much tedious job as compared to the graph data models. Uh, any more questions, Dalia? All good. Okay, so uh, now let's see the how we perform, uh, how we actually do a graph data modeling. So uh, let's say I just have a small whiteboard uh, sketch in here. So I mean, people say that graph data models are very whiteboard friendly. Why it is so? Uh, let's see. So what is here? I have just written that uh, Hugo Weaving acted in the matrix directed by Lana Wazowski, who also directed Cloud, Cloud Atlas. Hugo Weaving also acted it in, and Tom Hanks also acted in Cloud Atlas. Okay, so this is my a very simple example of a real world thing which is happening. And if I just quickly convert it into this and say that, okay, this is one node Tom Hanks, this is one node, this is another node matrix, and these are my main nodes. Lana directed matrix and Cloud Atlas. Tom Hanks acted in Cloud Atlas. Hugo Weaving acted in both. OK, so this is one step. And in the second step, I start to mark it with the attributes and the labels. So Tom Hanks is a person and an actor. Hugo Weaving is also a person and an actor. Matrix is a movie, Cloud Atlas is a movie. He is a person and a director. And these are the relationships between them with the specific roles. OK, so this is now a graph data model. And this can, as it is, be stored in a physical level and can be queried upon the, depending upon the directed graphs. Over here, uh, mm -hmm. shouldn't we create person as a, in, a node and then add tag, just add tag actor and director top of it? Uh, because it's same information you're storing at two different places, I guess. There. Like in the person information name and bond, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing you're storing at two different places. So you're making a, actually director is also a person, right? Director or mm -hmm. director or person. Mm -hmm. So we can create one person uh, as a node and another movie as a node, right? To make it more simpler. Uh, okay, so uh, there is one difference. This is the instance example, like graph. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I would say if, if you uh, look at an example of a topology driven thing, or if you want to design a topology, then probably you will create a node which is called person. Okay. And then you will create uh, a movie. Okay. And that's all. Director, actor, that can be an, another label or another property as such. But uh, this is a shift. You can do it like this also. Each Tom had entity, his entity is a node, which is a person, which is an actor, person, actor. So this entity is not as a, uh, this entity anyway have to be stored separately itself, right? No, Tom Hanks need to, wait, wait, Tom Hanks need to be stored separately. Hugo Weaving and Lana also need to be saved separately as a separate instance, right? 
But this is a data example, not logical view of it, right? I think this is what the difference is. This uh, is the actual how the data is saved, that example, how it will look like in a graph. But logically, yeah. when you are de deciding a model, then there will be only two entity. No. Moving That's a schema. Right. This is actually the instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but rather, when we will define the system, uh, in logically, we will define this uh, movie uh, system. Uh, there will be only two, two uh, logical nodes, right? Yeah, well, that, that, yeah. If you talk about schema, there's only two entities here, but, uh, and uh, maybe multiple relationships. But yeah. but uh, the whole, the point of this system is uh, you don't have to have the schema. Uh, yes. So maybe maybe we'll cover this some sometime. Yeah, yeah, you can so, you can just start by creating this uh, the, the, this data directly. Yeah. So uh, as Gary, as I said that I mean, if you want to have a topology or a schema defined, then probably you will do it in some different ways. Here you don't need actually to define a uh, schema itself because when you save this, this as such can be saved. And when you save this, you can query it by person, you can query it by actor or director, you can query it by acted in or something like that. So everything is a schema free kind of thing and that's why it's, it's extensible and more relationship can be uh, grown and can be made with time. So, whatever. Uh, I was saying also same queries can be answered in the same speed and it is also extendable. No, it, it will not be in speed because the schema when, when here there is a no node called person. The node is an instance itself only tagged as person. No, but these are two different things, right? Jari? The schema and, and uh, actual instances, right? So when you query a schema, what you get is uh, the answer about the schema. So they are not they are not uh, apple to apple here. Mm. So you can imagine this as uh, if you relate to relational databases, one is a table schema, other one is the actual records. These are records. These are actual records. But rather when let's say there is a system now somebody asked us to design the data model design the model for this. Okay, then at that time we will not design design like this, right? So, so the the purpose of these databases is that um, you can't possibly imagine a schema upfront. Um, so, let's say the web is, uh, if you look at web as a whole, it is evolving, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody had a uh, had a schema of uh, anything in the beginning. It evolved into something. So, uh, let's say a social graph system. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting created in two different continents in the world. So somebody uh, in Europe is creating um, a social graph. They collect information about people and mm -hmm. they define it in their own way. And a similar uh, concept is evolving in, in Asia, uh, but uh, the, we, we, we never agree upfront about how to represent that person. So we just start first. But uh, most logically, uh, the, we at some, stay, at some point in time, these things will link up. So for example, um, countries, if you say, uh, there is at least a standard country names mm -hmm. and using the country names, uh, suddenly these graphs, some nodes will start to connect to each other. Mm -hmm. So it is built for such evolutionary uh, uh, systems, but it, it is, uh, it also leads to a lot of problems because of uh, not having schema up front. Things are not standardized and things won't match. So, so such things are also there. So. Um, the spirit of these uh, databases is to is to get get things evolved first without a predefined um, uh, strict model, and then com then comes the standardization after that much later. Raja, how we are saying that uh, the the way I am saying is defining the schema. So when you when you say a schema means you are talking about um, uh, an abstract definition of a person, abstract definition of a movie. That's it. There is nothing more to it, right? You say the movie uh, means movie must have a name, movie must have uh, um, when it was released. A person must have a name, person must have a gender, where he was born, when he was born. So these are abstract definitions, right? But when you talk about in actual instances, then you say Tom Hanks is a person. And if you are very strict about schema, when you create Tom Hanks, you will, you will follow the schema and you will define those attributes. You will say name, where he was born, uh, when he was born. And by strictly adhering to schema, you will not add anything more. You you won't um, say anything less. 
no no what i was saying that there is a person and there is a movie what information you want to save in that that's a different thing right but only there only there can be two nodes right person and the movie okay this is yeah 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 that's the definition of a, a, a schema mm. Mm. so so if you take relational table let's say you have a person table and a movie table you person table will have million records movie table will have million records mm. here this example is talking about those million records each box each of the box here is talking about one record okay so can you go to the previous example not this one the one at the start yeah over here also raja we are doing at the logical level like project person organization department we are not working at an at a number value right what we are working at a particular record so if, yeah here in the right hand side you are looking at a particular record when you say person id 100 10000 name is jane you are looking at a record here actually oh, okay mm. hmm okay Okay. Okay. Moving on. So uh, there are basically four building blocks: nodes, relationships, labels, and properties. Okay. So uh, as we have discussed, also nodes are uh, nodes are the entities, the real world entities, which can be represented uh, through a node, and relationships are actually. Uh, the connectivity between these two entities okay labels are provided to the node so each node can have uh, one or more or zero labels also okay properties nodes ca- can have their own properties and relationships also can have their own properties so uh, with the same example so basically these four are the nodes okay and uh, these are the properties for each one of them like title start date person id first name so these are the properties and these are actually the instance of that as an example and now these are the relationships which can uh, exist in between them and this role role one is actually a property of this relationship okay so you can see it from here that one node can have more than one relationships to one or more nodes it can also have more than one relationship between two nodes same nodes and it can also have a relationship to itself also that is also allowed in this okay so this is a uh, very basic of the graph data modeling and this is the way to do it i mean create the nodes and then try to find the attributes create the relationships and try to uh, define the properties of that relationships if available and then try to label the nodes if any existing relationship or any new relationship is formed in there so few basic tips which we can uh, use is actually to write your queries okay so to to start when you start data modeling you have to the first step is to write your queries which you want to get answers of from a graph model prioritize them then build the model okay and test it out at what query which you want to run is been successfully answered by the graph which you have created and then if not then you can refactor it anytime so that's sort how graph data modeling is done by prioritize them what do you mean Prioritizing, prioritizing means which query takes. I mean, which query is more important to a business uh, than to a query which is not very important but it's a good to have. To. Uh, when you write business use cases, some use cases would be to a very high potential that these need to be answered in a correct way, or these need to be answered uh, uh, to to the full. And some queries that okay, if it is not possible it's okay but if it is what is possible it's good so it's just prioritizing those things so when you prioritize the queries which you want to have answers for certain your modeling will uh, bend towards that to answer those questions 
rather than uh, starting to a query which is not that important to the business. We are thinking that the, the model cannot answer 100% of the questions. That's why we are prioritizing it. Uh, any model I don't think can answer 100% of everything, but some queries, if you design, uh, because you are designing, right? So if you model, uh, you well, modeling, you can take care of how fast that query can run. Okay, so how much nodes, how much relationship we have to get to get that answer? Can we reduce that relationships to an extent that it, this prioritized query can get a little faster? And the non-prioritized queries can result in a little slower output also. <coughs> okay. So, so that's what prioritizing is. Yes. We cannot say that all the real-time questions are answered by a data model or not. But when you model, where you try to answer all the questions, but definitely you will prioritize which are the most important questions to answer, to get an answer from. Okay. Maybe uh, at the time we decide on creating a new relation, if uh, the query uh, I mean, that is going to be most frequent, frequently used by the business, yeah. uh, we might end up creating a new relation between th those kind of nodes. Yeah. Uh, one more question, uh, Kuldeep. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just trying to understand the building blocks. So, from what I understand, the nodes can have a set of properties. Uh, yeah. Relationships can have set of properties, yeah. but labels they what I think is inherit the properties of the nodes. They don't have their own properties, right? No, they don't have their own properties. Their properties uh, they actually are you can say a small tag to every node. So uh, this come this come into uh, the picture when you say that okay this person okay <coughs> is working in a uh, organization in a project in an organization and he's also a blogger who writes this he who owns a website and he who uh, writes this blog and talks about this topic okay so let's say there is an extension of this graph also here. OK, now uh, a person who wants to query for the blogger, no need to understand the project and department and organization. He will start with the blogger label and then query the graph from here. Uh, getting my point? Yeah, I mean, um, my point is uh, the properties of that um, label uh, will not be present in the same node, but might be present as some other relations to that uh, label. Like you're saying, uh, the if someone more, more like an alternative name, right? Uh, could be? Yes, sir. so yeah. it's basically a tag. So these properties are of this node. Yeah, these so, will so always I, remain this node. Mm, yeah, yeah, one way to imagine this is a label is another attribute of a node uh, where it is uh, it has a specific meaning. Uh, the moment you say a label, it represents alternative name. That's all. Mm, that, uh, that's right. A, Mm. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to uh, understand here. So uh, the moment we say that there is a new label to that node, uh, but the set of the properties for that particular node, now it is a label, remains the same. Any new properties we want to add or any new relations we need to add, we'll have to create new nodes for that, which might be of a different uh, type of node. Well, not really. It, it, so it, you mean... Just an alternative name only. So, so it's like you have a Java class, but you can only have one name for a Java class. But imagine that if you are able to uh, have alternative names for the Java class, that's that's all we are talking about. Everything else is uh, is is the same. So it, it's an alternative, not not an extension. Not an extension. It doesn't change the meaning um, completely. It's just an alternative name. Okay. So should I move forward? Now we are clear for ah, these yes. four building blocks. Yes, okay, now uh, I hope the how is clear. So we will jump into the when part. So uh, when <clears throat> we should use graph data model uh, is to when the data interconnectivity is quite important. So uh, basically, if you see the social networks uh, and other <clears throat> what should other examples would be social networks and other things where actually the relationships are also important. You cannot leave out relationships and just focus on entities. 
in that case is it's, it's good to use a graph data model okay storing the actual entities and actual data in any form, in in the physical layer can be different because graph modeling can be done for relational no sql and obviously graph databases also okay so uh, <clears throat> following that point the complexity the complexity when the complexity becomes more complex when you have much more relationships and uh, relationship after relationship a friend of a friend or these kind of things that come into picture and that takes precedence in your business requirement then uh, graph data modeling is the best way for you out and because of that complexity and because that <clears throat> the relationships are taken into precedence the graph databases are also uh, performance high performance in such kind of scenario and the flexibility is always high because you have a uh, you can say an option to extend your data or extend your model to add new nodes and new relationships okay so the flexibility and agility, agility comes from there okay so i will try to uh, make a point through this uh, small chart uh, when you say a uh, data complexity on the x and data quantity on the y okay so quantity means there are huge volume of data for entities and you need to process it and you need to uh, let's say traverse throughout the database for uh, some information in that cases actually big data and all those solutions are much more faster and helpful but they don't take care but they don't take much care of the relationships existing between data and that is left to the application side it's for fast uh, retrieval of the huge amount of data quantity okay and graph db actually comes in here where the complexity is uh, quite high but if the volume grows your graph become more and more complex and since be, since your graph becomes more and more complex the querying of graph and the amount of subgraph you are querying also increases so that's why the performance is tend to decrease when the quantity is going to increase so that's how in the real time uh, in the real world i would say uh, graph data models or graph db are actually used where a uh, used for a module or a section of business where the relationships are important rest all the huge data and the data processing is actually taken care of big data itself so people tend to use the combination of uh, big data or no sql and a graph db over that uh, is it clear or any questions this way the social media uh, kind of use cases they will not end up using the uh, exact definition of graph db but somewhere between yes so i mean that's what i mean if you see in the uh, facebook or twitter also they uh, use graph db for a specific purpose they don't use it all the way to save everything inside that they use it only when the relationship or connectivity or tagging or all those things need to be taken care of rest all the huge quantity of data is stored in some different way okay okay should i move forward yeah okay so uh, after this uh, let's look at this graph database space so uh, <clears throat> here actually non native means so there are two things like right? graph storage and graph processing okay so graph storage uh, non native is that they don't store in a graph uh, graphical way that means they don't store in a node and relationship way they store in some different way but they provide some mechanism to uh, consume it as a graph okay and graph processing so this graph processing means the querying the graph node by node uh, path by path relationship by relationship so this is what actually graph processing so if you see uh, this blog db which was the tutor 
<clears throat> db. It's it's between in here somewhere where not completely on the graph storage and non natively on the graph processing also. So this Arago graph is totally native. It stores the actual nodes. <clears throat> and uh, now I think they also provide graph processing, but which is not very uh, efficient till now. So this <laughs> Microsoft Trinity, Titan, Infinity Graph, they don't store in a graph native storage. They store in some different way, but they provide graph processing capabilities over what they have stored. Okay, so these are the databases actually Neo4j, Affinity, Orient DB. These are the things who store also in a graph uh, format and obviously give the graph processing capability on top of that. Okay, let's look at on the uh, in other angle also. It's a simple Venn diagram. So LPG is actually linear property graph. Okay, RDF. Uh, it's actually a linked data format where things are stored in subject, predicate, and object kind of way. Triples. And then this is our document databases and Q value store. So if you see, this, this is quite new Azure Cosmos DB, which actually falls into somewhere here. Okay, so the complete uh, graph. Graph databases are Neo4j, Tiger Graph, because they provide the storage <coughs> mechanism as graph and processing mechanism as graph also. Okay, any question on this? Uh... Good, good for me. Hmm. Okay, so. Uh... So we can now go into any other questions which we have. So uh, before going into that, we just, just need to quickly give you two, three points on what's the good side of the graph database and what's the bad side also. So good side, we have seen that what is flexible searching and indexing. In graph database, the relationships are also indexed. So that's why the performance on the search and uh, traversing comes fast. Uh, the bad part is, as I said, processing high volumes of transaction data is not good to use graph database in here. Uh, similarly, for the large volume of analytical queries. Okay, and the, the major point is <coughs> the at the time of modeling, if the relationships are, relationships are not uh, defined correctly as per the requirements, then they these graph databases because there is not much focus on schema. They have the capability to go into a very massive architecture and which has become very uh, <clears throat> non efficient at the end of the day. So, the relationship between entities have to be defined very efficiently at the first place. So, these are the few drawbacks of a graph database. Okay, so that's all from me. Any, any questions or I'm good. One one question. Uh, I mean, it's not a question exactly, but it's a thought that I came that came to my mind. So I mean, uh, in relational DBs, we have thought of uh, merging two different DBs with two different models, uh, wherein we find the dependencies and all try to solve that and uh, maybe come up with a new relational data model. But in the case of graph model, if we're trying to create a new model by merging two existing graph models, it will be creating a new, uh, I would say, a new graph model as such. I mean, uh, taking the yes, it will it will it will be creating a new graph model, but it's actually a simplistic union of these two. So which nodes relate to which node in both the models? You can just connect them, and you are up and running. So you don't need to spend much more time on uh, <clears throat> because both both are graph and both are flexible to extend, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just the connection between the two model graphs. Let's say there are four entities in model one and five entities in model one, model two, which needs to be connected. 
okay so we can quickly just make these connections or if there is a need of an uh, another entity another node to be created we just create that node and connect it quickly so i mean it's it's easier in this compared to relational and now from where i see mostly it'll be like because the entities are already defined and uh, in two different systems the entities have their meaning mostly uh, merging two would be like uh, uh, having relationships uh, between those entities of the different worlds creating the relationship would be the challenge if you're trying to merge them the entities will have their own properties always that mm -hmm. not change. Yeah, that, let's take one uh, quick example uh, I, I this this problem is what uh, linked data initiative is trying to solve so yeah. number one is uh, the entity uh, must be uh, uniquely resolvable right so for example let's say sharad um, let's say i doc I start to document about sharad in, in here in singapore his uh, professional uh, aspects and then Sharad's father starts to document about Sharad. His, uh, his, uh, um, the, uh, the non-professional non uh, aspects of uh, Sharad. <laughs> it's not unprofessional, but non-professional. <laughs> Let's say his uh, uh, demographic details of Sharad. His father is documenting. Now, w one thing that is important is that the entity called Sharad, we must uniquely uh, at least agree on uh, a unique name for Sharad. So linked data initiative has something called URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. Um, imagine that there is a registry in the world where I go and look for Sharad Gupta and it is going to give me a, a URI, uh, which looks like HTTP uh, www.person.com slash Sharad, let's say. So as long as there is such a registry, Sharad's father will start to create all the data about Sharad using that um, as the key. And I, I also use the same key and, cre and create my own side of the database. Now you will suddenly see that uh, these two things can merge, although they are in two different uh, databases across the continent. All of a sudden, if they, they, these are resolvable and linkable, and especially if the URI is a HTTP based URI, um, suddenly it becomes uh, uh, web linkable also. So I document that Sharad works here in Singapore. He stays here and uh, he's so on and so professionally and his father documents his demographic and now the knowledge adds up and uh, now one plus one is more than two in, in this kind of a scenario, right? So graph databases allow these kind of uh, uh, not, not so pre-prepared evol evolutions. If you have to do it in a relational database, first of all, me and Sharad's father should sit together and uh, create a schema first. Uh, and, one, and then the schema must be created in the database. And then we, when we start to put the records, the relational database will force us to stick to the schema. Um, obviously, there, are, there is, there is uh, definitely something good uh, that comes from that because we can query this much efficiently, uh, et cetera. But, but in the other way, where we don't have to have a, a predefined schema, let's say Charles' father is, is very good in uh, describing things uh, demo demographically, he doesn't have to agree that schema with me, where I am good with describing Sharad professionally. I don't have to agree with my schema with him. So we just start to evolve parallelly. All you have to agree upon is this particular uh, URI name. So that's just the simplest uh, example where graph databases really perform uh, uh, very well, more applicable here. So in the linked data uh, world, uh, they realized this and then they start to create uh, different uh, groups of people like Yahoo, uh, Google, Microsoft, they all come together and they create this kind of uh, common URIs, uh, common relationship names. For example, how do you describe a spouse of someone? Should you call um, a spouse? Should you call uh, husband slash wife? So there is a place where you can go and uh, registry where you can query, what is the standard URI to describe uh, a spouse relationship? Now, these things are evolving. Now you can imagine that you know um, if more and more people start to use the standard URIs to describe uh, the entities and the relationships, you can have um, uh, knowledge evolving from different places uh, and then suddenly linkable by the web. The, the, this is what we call the 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 world the world of linked data. Yeah. 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 Okay. This will definitely make uh, the merging of big companies. For example, Facebook and WhatsApp, they have different kind of data. Mm -hmm. I mean, linking that uh, data would be easy. Like that. Yeah. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So, so you have social graphs from different places, the wall gardens. If you want to break through them, this, these technologies will help in that. Yeah, this is, uh, imagine that uh, today, I, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn follow a URI named to represent us. Uh, all of a sudden, you have uh, LinkedIn having professional details, Facebook having our personal, uh, uh, the, the, those details, and suddenly all these things merge together and becomes a big knowledge base. Okay, good. Okay. All good, then we can stop recording here. Yeah. Thank you.